Church Junk Show on this Sunday, June 28th, 2015. I'm David Knight. I'll be your host today. It's an amazing week for news this week. We've seen a lot of moves towards world government, towards abandoning the rule of law, first by the Congress, then by the Supreme Court, just making things up out of thin air. And I'm talking about both Supreme Court decisions this week. We also have uh, what looks like a repeat of last week, but this may be the real thing happening in Greece this week. We have a uh, the, the financial situation there may be coming to a peak this week. There's a major payment that needs to be made on Tuesday. And, of course, the Greek prime minister has uh, gotten it passed that they're going to have a referendum on whether or not they should accept this, de this deal, which is essentially going to be a referendum of whether or not they should leave the EU. The uh, Troika, the IMF, the European Central Bank, have come in and offered, made what they said is their last and final offer. So basically, if this is a poker game, they're kind of going to set on their uh, uh, the hand that they have dealt uh, to the uh, the Greek people. And so now the Greek people are, are set up with a choice as to whether or not they're going to stay in this union. A prime minister said, as an equal member of the EU, Greece does not need to ask permission from anyone to let the Greek people speak and have their voices heard. That's the prime minister, Cyprus. He told Parliament, and Parliament gave that power, set up the referendum. Of course, there have been referendum uh, uh, issues throughout different places in Europe. And essentially, we, we had the one in Scotland that was just uh, recently happened. And I think it's very interesting to look at the reaction of the BBC, for example, because there was a lot of manipulation of public opinion when they were running up to that referendum in Scotland. Uh, they pushed back. They told everybody it's going to be the end of the world. And it may be currency controls coming down. The BBC reported that they would uh, definitely have currency control. They said Greek finance minister had confirmed this to them. Nevertheless, he immediately tweeted out and said, capital controls within a monetary union are a contradiction in terms. A Greek government opposes the very concept. So we have the BBC floating this idea out along with others who are part, part of the Troika saying that uh, if they vote to not accept this deal, it means that their cash is going to be confiscated. They're going to have currency control, so they'll not be able to get their cash out of the banks. But that may not be the position of the Greek government. Certainly, they push back on that immediately. Is this another uh, case of the BBC trying to manipulate people, to manipulate public opinion? We've seen that happen before, of course. Uh, it wouldn't be anything new. They also point out earlier on Saturday, the Eurogroup decided that the Greek bailout program would not be extended beyond Tuesday. There is a one and a half billion euro payment that is due to the IMF on Tuesday. If that doesn't happen, it's going to hit the fan. And this is something that's been in the cards for a long time. They're now holding still on their positions. This is the way it happens. It goes for a very, very long time. People are lulled into a kind of apathy, thinking that something will never happen. That's our concern here when we look at things like Jade Helm and other issues. They'll put something up and people will say, well, look, this is where this is eventually headed. They'll say, oh, well, it's going to happen immediately when it doesn't happen immediately, when it doesn't happen the next time around. After a while, people become numb to what is going on. We need to understand that when bankruptcy happens, when tyranny happens, it happens very gradually, very slowly. Then it happens suddenly. So that's what the people of Greece need to understand. That's what we need to understand. And when we look at world government, we need to see how this is being manipulated within the EU, within the euro currency. We know that came from the Bilderberg Group back at their second meeting in uh, 1955. They proposed this uh, exact situation. They said, we're going to achieve political union, first through economic union, then through a centralized currency, and then with crisis we can take over the political union. That's what we've seen floated out by Alan Greenspan. That's what we've seen floated out by the largest bond-holding company in the world, PIMCO, has said the same thing. Either Greece is going to have to submit to this, give up their sovereignty, or get out. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. And we're going to talk about this brave new world. Well, it seems to me that the, the nature of the ultimate revolution with which we are now faced is precisely this. Uh, that we are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy.
have always existed and presumably always will exist, uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, this is, the, it seems to me, the, the ultimate uh, in malevolent revolution, to be said. From the front lines of the information war, it's Alex Jones. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Sunday, June 28th, 2015. I'm David Knight, and that lugubrious uh, voice that you just heard there was Aldous Huxley. I asked the crew to play that because, to me, this last week has moved us so far into a brave new world. He talked about having people love their slavery. And, of course, there's many ways that he proposed in the book that this would happen. Of course, the central premise of Brave New World was a one-world government. We saw that happen being pushed this week in multiple ways. We saw the Pope selling a global government with a uh, Congress, with a constitution, with a planetary council and court. That's what his advisor pointed out. Of course, he didn't specifically, the Pope didn't have that in his encyclical, but that's what the advisor that he appointed to his Pontifical Scientific Advisory Council has said in the past. Of course, a big population control man as well. So we see the Pope pushing in the name of global warming for a world government. He said quite clearly, this is a problem that had to be tackled at the world level. He said that states could no longer really handle this because we needed to control the multinational corporations that were the problem that we're bringing this on. The problem is, it's the multinational corporations that already control the governments. And the multinational corporations want that world government. We saw that as Congress moved ahead with fast track to try to present these secret treaties that we've heard bits and pieces of. We've had Senator Sessions tell us about it. But these are secret treaties that would create an economic union. They would do many things to us. They would not only surrender our jobs to other countries, giving these multinational corporations or these secret organizations that have written this secret treaty, give them power over our jobs, over our economy. No, it would give them power over our food as well. It would give them power over our medicine, over the Internet. Very far reaching. But perhaps the most troubling thing about this is that once this is surrendered, once the Congress surrenders its power, and they've already surrendered the constitutional process of approving treaties, once they surrender the power of this treaty, once they sur surrender their oversight to this transnational body, as Jeff Sessions, uh, Senator Sessions has pointed out, once they surrender to that, there will be no control by any government, not just our government, but any government of this transnational committee. They will be able to modify the agreement, add people as they wish, like China. We're told that this is a pushback against China. They'll be able to add people as they wish, and they will be able to change it as they wish. Of course, immigration is going to be a part of that. Gun control can possibly be a part of that. So we have seen the Pope selling global government for the purpose of climate control. We've seen the Congress surrendering power to a transnational committee this last week. And we have seen the Supreme Court just arbitrarily operate however they wish, uh, both Obamacare as well as the uh, issue of marriage. They have just gone off the rails, not even paying attention to the written law. The Constitution is no longer an issue for them. It's a living document. It's whatever they believe they would like to see happen, whether it's Obamacare subsidies or whether it is same-sex marriage. They push it through without any legal basis. A large part of this, of course, because we don't want to have anybody talking about the real legal basis of these decisions. A large part of Huxley's Brave New World was to discourage critical thinking. They wanted a population that was dumbed down, that was distracted, a population that was raised by the state. What do we have today? We see with these Supreme Court decisions, words don't mean anything. It means whatever they say it means. And when you have that, you create a dictatorship. You destroy the rule of law. Just as we've seen Congress turning over its legislative powers to some secretive, undetermined transnational committee, we now have the Supreme Court just Ignoring the rule of law, where words mean nothing at all, where we appeal to the authority of our leaders, the arbitrary whims of our leaders. The law is whatever they happen to say it is at any given point. That's the very definition 
of a dictatorship. And of course, one of the ways that they make this happen is by focusing the population on hedonism. That was a key part, of course, a brave new world, that people would love their slavery. They would be so distracted by hedonism and the pursuit of pleasure as the supreme goal that uh, they would not be able to think. Everything would be emotional. Even the movies in his book would become feelies. And that's what we have today. We have people making their decisions on their feelings, not paying any attention to the words and the Constitution. And then also, there was the population control that Huxley had. Where marriage was mocked, marriage was deconstructed, childbirth was vulgar. Is that what we're going to see with traditional marriage, with traditional families? I think it is. Welcome to the brave new world, where we've got world government, we've got population control, we've got abortion, we've got abolition of natural marriage and reproduction. We have a population that is dumbed down and distracted by hedonism. Now, if you don't buy into that, if you see what's happening, they've got another plan for you. Another novel. It's called 1984. Let's take a look at this Supreme Court decision. We have an article on Infowars.com. Samuel Alito, one of the uh, Supreme Court justices who dissented from the marriage decision, says defenders of traditional marriage now risk being treated as bigots by governments, employers, and schools. Justice Samuel Alito said the court had falsely likened opposition to same-sex marriage to racism. And said the decision will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. Let me read you some of his uh, decision here. He said, today's decision usurps the constitutional right of people to decide whether to keep or to alter the traditional understanding of marriage. The decision will also have other important consequences. It will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. We have already seen that. This is not a theory. We have seen that with these bakery decisions. Remember the Oregon bakery, the small business that was fined $135,000 by an administrative judge saying that they had discriminated because they would not bake a cake uh, that had something to do with uh, homosexual marriage. They said, that violates my religious beliefs to do that. They said, we don't care what your religious beliefs are. We don't care what your religious beliefs are when it comes to vaccinating your kids. We don't care what your personal consent is. They no longer care. But the key thing, and he points this out, is that they have, in the Supreme Court decision, the majority equated this with denying African Americans and women equal protection under the law. That's why they referenced the 14th Amendment. And of course, the 14th Amendment came in uh, as part of an answer to Reconstruction and the blowback uh, that happened in Reconstruction against, it was against the federal government, but they turned it against the black people. The same as the federal government is now trying to create a race war here. That was what came out of Reconstruction. And so to stop that, the 14th Amendment was put in to say that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. That was to give human rights, citizen rights to the slaves that had been freed by the 13th Amendment. Now, that was referenced, and rightfully so, in a court case uh, called Loving, where it was about interracial marriage that had been prohibited by law in uh, some southern state. And that was precisely what the 14th Amendment was written to stop. But then they took that and said, well, because that was marriage, kind of tangentially involved, they expanded that to include all marriage. And we understand from the 10th Amendment that the federal government that was created by sovereign states well after the revolution was given specific and limited things. They were very concerned that power was going to be consolidated to the center. So they divided power in multiple ways and within the center and said, if we haven't specifically given you powers, you cannot presume those powers. But that is what they did this week with both the marriage decision and with Obamacare. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. We have a lot of news. It's not just about the Supreme Court decision this week, but we have seen multiple ways in which we have lost the rule of law. It's been surrendered to transnational bodies or people pushing for it to be surrendered to transnational bodies in the way of the Trade Promotion Authority. We're going to quickly see these trade agreements they've been crafting for years that will be comprehensive. They will affect every aspect of our lives, whether we see that 
initially or not. And of course, it will remove control from our governments to a central transnational committee. That's what we've been told by the senators who have seen this. Nevertheless, we rushed headlong into that. We have rushed headlong into lawless Supreme Court decisions, and I'm going to talk about that. But before I do, I want to let you know this hour of The Alex Jones Show is made possible by your support of the high-quality products we sell at InfoWarsLife.com. Products like our Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. You know, for me, it's a no-brainer to take this. It's a habit. I do it every day. Every morning, I take this along with other supplements that I get. And I prefer, because I take so many supplements, I prefer to take them in liquid form because I know they're highly bioavailable in liquid form. I don't have to swallow a lot of pills, but I know that this works. Survival Shield X2 is one of the best ways that you can get a vital uh, supplement, iodine, that you need in your diet. Uh, we also have Liver Shield uh, that I was going to start this last weekend, but um, it's now out of stock. And if you're wanting to start a liver cleanse, you can also... Uh, get on the waiting list at InfoWarsLife.com, and we will e email you when that comes back in. Again, uh, Liver Shield is out of stock, but right now you can get X2 nascent iodine. That was out of stock for quite a while, so now is a good time to stock up on that. We have over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. 99% of the respondents would recommend it to a friend or to a family member, so get your bottle of X2. Read the more than 400 reviews, and you can see all of that at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Now, as I was just pointing out in the last uh, segment, what we have seen here with the uh, multiple things that have happened this last week, it was pretty clear where this is headed. And I just read you some of the uh, statements from Justice Alito saying that, uh, well, perhaps, perhaps we will be allowed to... Uh, whisper our thoughts if we have any dissenting thoughts about this in the recesses of our homes. But if we repeat those views in public, we will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, by employers, by schools. That's what he wrote in his decision. And also, as I pointed out before, this is something that uh, is not the authority of the federal government. The Tenth Amendment would make that case. He says the system of federalism established by our Constitution provides a way for people with different beliefs to live together in a single nation. If the issue of same-sex marriage had been left to the people of the states, it's likely that some states would have recognized same-sex marriage, others would not. It's also possible some states would tie recognition to protection for conscience rights. The majority today make that impossible in the Supreme Court. By imposing its own views on the entire country, the Supreme Court majority facilitates the marginalization of many Americans who have traditional ideas. Recalling the harsh treatment of gays and lesbians in the past, some may think that a turnaround is fair play. But if that sentiment prevails, the nation will experience bitter and lasting wounds. Yes, because you know, political correctness is not about tolerance. That's simply the mask that it wears. They will not tolerate your dissent. And that's fundamentally what this is about. We can see it already happening. Look at this from the mirror, the silencing. A paper will limit anti-gay marriage op-eds. This is a paper in Pennsylvania, the Penn Live, Patriot News in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It says they're taking a hardcore stance against those who disagree with the Supreme Court ruling on gay marriage. They said as a result of Friday's ruling, their paper, the Penn Live, Patriot News, will no longer accept nor will it print op-eds and letters to the editor in opposition to same-sex marriage. A lot of people were outraged by that, that a, uh, a newspaper would uh, shut down any dissent of that. And so they revised their policy and said, clarification, we will not foreclose discussion of the high court's decision, but arguments that gay marriage is wrong or unnatural are out. And as one person wrote, well, I don't mind who's marrying who, but it's a good day to be a divorce lawyer. Well, that's true. There's going to be a lot more uh, opportunity for divorce lawyers to practice their trade. But uh, there's also going to be a lot more of the type of thing that we saw at the bakeries that were compelled to uh, bake cakes that they felt uh, violated their religious beliefs, refused on a religious basis. Nevertheless, they said that uh, they were discriminating against others, gave them a very heavy fine. And we're going to see organizations like the ACLU jump into this as well, because it's not just destroying uh, freedom of religion and also freedom of speech. It's both parts of the First Amendment. Now, the ACLU says 
on the Washington Post why we can no longer support the federal religious freedom law. Now, they point out by saying they've, re they've supported the, uh, the law that Congress put into effect, which was supposed to strengthen the First Amendment's protection of the free exercise of religion. See, your beliefs are not something that you need to keep hidden in a closet. You actually are allowed to exercise your religion according to the First Amendment. That's a human right, and it was explicitly recognized in the supreme law of the land that every one of these people who serves in government has taken an oath to uphold. See, the Constitution is really the king. These people who are in office are merely temporary placeholders, stewards, representatives of ours, but they swear to uphold the Constitution. Nevertheless, they're not interested in protecting the free exercise of religion, except when it comes to perhaps trivial things. That's what the ACLU is talking about. They say, well, you know, we've had this case of um, uh, a guy who was a, uh, an Indian, a uh, Sikh, and he wanted to join the army, but he didn't want to have to shave his beard, cut his hair, remove his turban, because that was part of his religious belief. And they say, the army has allowed beards uh, for other people, for Jewish men. They let them wear yarmulkes. They let women wear their hair long because of religious beliefs. And so the ACLU supports that kind of thing. See, the ACLU is always there for the trivial issues or the things that are very controversial but not consequential. Things like standing up and supporting the right of Nazis to parade through a predominantly Jewish town in Illinois, but they will not stand up for your right to have equal access to the ballot. See, we have a controlled electoral process that begins by saying that independent candidates and independent parties cannot get on the ballot. That's essentially controlled by the two major parties. They have laws in every state that keep third parties and independents from participating. We could never get the ACLU to help us to do that when I was working with third parties in North Carolina. They don't want to do anything that is really consequential. They'll get out there and they'll support the rights of Nazis to march up and down and be provocative, or even the rights of the Ku Klux Clowns. But they won't support your right to exercise religion. And so they list in this uh, op-ed piece here, they talk about the Hobby Lobby case. Because, you know, we can't have people exercising their freedom of religion when we've got an unconstitutional mandate to buy insurance that we need to shove down their throats. And that's the way they're going to look at this decision with marriage. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Alex Jones here with an exciting announcement. Do you have what it takes to join the info war? Would you like to work here in Austin, Texas, inside the InfoWars News Center that now reaches more than 18 million people across the globe every week. We need InfoWarriors. We need talented people who love the truth, who love freedom, and who love humanity to join our operation. We're going to be taking applications at the email jobs at InfoWars.com and online at InfoWars.com at InfoWars.com forward slash jobs. We're going to be hiring radio crew. We're going to be hiring writers. We're going to be hiring investigative journalists. We're going to be going out there directly to you, the patriots who love freedom all over this country who want to work inside our operation. Now, most of the hires will be inside InfoWars. Some can work remotely as writers. We're going to be hiring folks uh, directly on but we're also going to be giving people a chance at paid internships to come in for a week, a month, or longer to see if you fit in to this operation. We're ready to go to the next level. Find out the details at infowars.com forward slash jobs or email us your resume, your video reel, uh, your background, what you stand for, and why you want to join the Infowars crew. So whether you're an established journalist or whether uh, you're just a novice video editor. What matters is that you take action, that you stand for freedom, and that you want to work hard in defense of human liberties. We're looking for journalists. We're looking for writers. We're looking for investigative reporters. We're looking for folks to help promote freedom via our social media platforms, graphic designers, paid internships, and if folks have got a good resume and a good background, we'll also be hiring some people directly on at InfoWars.com as we prepare to take the fight to the next level against the new world order. In 20 years, 
InfoWars has been exponentially growing. We're about to hopefully take a huge leap forward when it comes to upping the amount of news we can cover, the amount of stories we can break, because world government is being rolled out in everybody's face right now. People are waking up. This is the time to have a maximum effort to reach out to humanity. And this is your chance to be part of the InfoWars.com news operations. So throw your hat in the ring if you think you've got what it takes. You're ready to take action. And I hope to be working side by side with you right here at the InfoWars.com news centers in Austin, Texas. So send those video reels. Send those graphic designs. Send your work to us so we can see if you've got what it takes to be part of this operation. Exactly. We're trying to grow the organization, and that's one of the things that you can help us with if you become a subscriber to Prison Planet TV or if you buy products at InfoWarsLife.com. And as I mentioned in the last segment, we're out of stock on the liver shield, but you can still sign up for that. When it gets back in stock, you will be given an email and a first chance to uh, get it. We do have uh, Survival Shield X2 back in stock, which has been out of stock for a while. So, again, stock up on it when you can uh, because they come and go. And you don't want to be left, especially with something uh, as important as iodine, uh, to your diet, to your survival if we have a... Uh, an unusual circumstance, let's just put it that way. We had the federal government buying millions of doses of iodine. You might ask, uh, why did they do it? Well, uh, there's a reason that they do it, and you want to have your supply as well. So that's also in stock right now. Now, as I was talking about the Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage in the last uh, a couple of segments, I found it just as surprising that the Pope was totally silent on this, as I found it surprising that he was pushing for a global regime in the name of global warming this last week. And of course, we did have the um, U.S. Catholic bishops make a statement. And the strange thing about it to me was, this is what he had to say. He said, uh, the unique meaning of marriage as the union of one man and one woman, and this is the Archbishop uh, Kurtz of Louisville, Kentucky. He's president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. He said, the unique meaning of marriage between one man and one woman is inscribed in our bodies as male and female. And this is what I think is interesting. He says, the protection of this meaning is a critical dimension of the integral ecology, quote unquote. He puts that in quotes that Pope Francis has called us to promote. So even he doesn't really appeal to any biblical authority or any papal authority to support marriage. Instead, he talks about integral ecology and after the, uh, as, as they were looking at the uh, uh, encyclical that was coming from the Pope, the Huffington Post had an article about Pope Francis's integral ecology. They said there's a new term being bandied about, and it's high time we paid heed. Integral ecology. They say whenever the same notion arises synchronously in a number of different contexts, in this case, the Catholic Church, the Occupy movement, the climate movement, the new economy movement, it's an idea whose time has arrived. No, it is an idea that is part of a propaganda campaign coming from the socialist left that uh, and the world government people. The Occupy movement, now what the Pope is doing is uh, using this and promoting scientists who have called for population control and world government. And of course, that's all part of the new economy movement. So the only way that they could try to um, uh, justify supporting traditional marriage was to refer to the Pope's pronouncement about global warming. And of course, it's, in one way, it's not surprising that they would do this. Because if I, as I've said before, climate change really is a religion. As a matter of fact, the guy who was head of the UN Council for that, the UN uh, IPCC, said, climate change is my religion, my dharma. They've made no bones about that. They have always argued from the position of authority. They say, we are the experts. And if you heard the program on Friday when I talked to Mark Dice and we went through all of these different uh, petitions that he's done in California, the underlying theme of all of that is just the blatant appeal to authority. If he would come up to somebody and say, do this for Obama, sign this petition for Obama, they would do it. Or if you tell them the majority of scientists believe that this is going to happen, they will do it. That's why today I brought in, I want you to get a picture of this magazine on the desk here. I brought in a an issue of Newsweek, a special report from July 16th, 1979, 36 years ago. 
The Energy Crisis, a program for the 80s. Now, when I open this up to that report, a program for the 80s, they have this page here, Why We Must Act Now. And if you can see this, back in 1979, the experts, the authorities that we're supposed to defer to unquestioningly, told us that we had 8.7 years left of crude oil. We had only 10.7 years left of natural gas. We have kind of a uh, glut of <laughs> natural gas right now. Um, but they were telling us that we had to act because we only had about 10 years left, and that was back in 1979. That's what the experts were telling us. And, of course, if you look down through this article, they had all kinds of stuff like, yeah, we need a massive new tax because we need to control and ration this resource. What are they proposing with a global climate change control? Well, massive new taxes. But, of course, they won't be going to any national government. They will be going to an international government. They will be going to some bankers who will uh, use that as kind of a religious indulgence for us. So whenever we see these kinds of pronouncements by the uh, authorities and we see this kind of consensus among scientists, we need to... Take that with a grain of salt. And I know many of you did. I saved this article because I knew it was total bunk. I knew it would be something we could all laugh at in a few years. And it is absolutely absurd to predict that by the late 1980s, we were going to be out of oil. But I, I remember pop tunes about that. There's only so much oil in the ground. Uh, I mean, that was from Tower of Power. It was a, it was a great song, but had nonsense lyrics uh, but we've seen that push through the culture. That was what everybody was saying at that point in time. We have reached peak oil. We're going to be out of crude oil. That didn't happen, so now they're trying to find a different way to control our energy use because that is the ultimate way that they can control you is through energy use. But they're not going to be content with that. They come at us from multiple directions. Just as we saw this last week, we had calls for world government from the Pope, but we also had calls... And, and pushing towards world government from these trade treaties, these trade agreements. They're also not going to limit themselves just to controlling your energy, of course. They're going to come after you medically. I want to read you the story when we come back of the mysterious death of a doctor who spoke out against vaccines. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If you didn't see it in the last segment, we're going to keep putting this up here. The projection from Newsweek back in 1979, how we only had 8.7 years left of crude oil and we only had 10.7 years left of natural gas. Notice how precise those numbers are. 8.7 years left and 10.7 years left. Okay, so we would have been 20 years ago out of both crude oil and natural gas if the experts were right. But of course, they always argue from authority. Pull that up one more time because there's a third one here that I didn't mention, and that is coal. They had worked out that we had precisely 666.5 years left. So at some point, it was going to be like on New Year's Eve, 666 years from 1979, because this was in July or whatever. They were going to run out of, uh, we will run out of coal. So uh, there you go. So we had to act then. And you know, it's interesting to see that. Their prescriptions were the same that we see for global warming and climate change now. Massive new taxes, rationing, government control, that's always a solution. Crisis, solution. And they offer us a phony, bad outcome that isn't going to really happen. There you go. You can see that massive new taxes that they're talking about. But, of course, we have... Today, a government that is not really even trying to scare us into action. They're just going to hold a gun to your head. That's what the trade agreements are essentially about. They're going to start trying to ram through Congress. Uh, this probably pretty soon. They've already written these trade agreements. They got fast track passed last week. And, of course, there are multiple bills uh, throughout this country, especially in California, where they're just going to hold a gun to your head and say, we don't really care uh, what you're... Uh, about your consent. We don't care what you believe. We don't care that you're concerned about risks. You don't get to make those decisions. You're going to do what we have to say. The science is settled and you're just going to do it in the same way that the science was settled in the late 70s that we were going to run out of oil in 10 years. We didn't. And the science is not settled about climate change. The science is not settled about vaccines. Take a look at this story from Science Daily. Whooping cough resurgence due to vaccinated people not knowing they're infectious? Question mark. This is from four days ago. They say whooping cough has made an astonishing comeback 
with 2012 seeing nearly 50,000 infections in the U.S., the most since 1955, and a death rate in infants three times that of the rest of the population. The dramatic resurgence has puzzled health officials, and they think that perhaps it's this anti-vaccine sentiment that is the likely culprit. No, that might not be the story, says Science Daily. They say that a recent study published by BMC Medicine in the, in the Santa Fe Institute they looked at their, the research pointed out to a different but related source of the outbreak. They said vaccinated people who are infectious but do not display the symptoms of whooping cough, suggesting the number of people transmitting without symptoms may be many times greater than those transmitting with symptoms. We have seen this with multiple diseases that they vaccinate for. We've seen this with an outbreak in New York where, the, uh, where patient zero was twice vaccinated. Patient zero transmitted that to four other patients who had also been vaccinated, two of them, twice. The other two uh, had antibodies that didn't have records for them, so they didn't know if they'd had one or two vaccinations. Nevertheless, all the people in that outbreak, and we I could go over a case after case after case. That's not the only one. This is happening constantly. So the two things to take away from this is that, number one, it's not conveying immunity. If it doesn't convey individual immunity, you're not going to get herd immunity. That is just smoke and mirrors. That's waving their hand over the fundamental issue that the vaccines are not effective. And then the other part of it is that they actually can create little typhoid marys who are going out there unintentionally spreading the disease. But I find it also interesting that on the same page, over on the side, there's a side article that says, Whooping cough vaccine recommended for pregnant women now because of a spike in cases. On the same page where they're saying that people are transmitting this and that they're having a high infant mortality, they're going to give it to pregnant women. So the pregnant women can then shed that to their infants, uh, either before or after birth, presumably. This is the kind of junk science that we're continuously seeing. And yet, when you have somebody who is actually getting some results, uh, they come after him. They come after him and destroy his reputation even attack him posthumously. This is a story of Dr. Jeff Bradstreet. This is a story that Adon Salazar picked up on Friday, and it was about a week after the doctor was found. Uh, his body was, he, they found his body floating in the river in North Carolina. And the title of the article is Mysterious Death, Body of Doctor Who Linked Vaccines to Autism Was Found Floating in a River. Say a prominent autism researcher and vaccine opponent was found dead floating in a North Carolina river last week under what many are calling suspicious circumstances. They say that he had a gunshot wound to the chest, which appeared to be self-inflicted, according to deputies, and they removed a handgun from the river. Now, I ask you, is that a the way that people typically commit suicide with handguns, shooting themselves in the chest? Uh, it doesn't seem likely to me. But here's the background of Dr. Bradstreet. Here's what you need to know about him. He ran a private practice in Buford, Georgia, which focused on treating children with autism spectrum disorder, PP, PPD, and related neurological and developmental disorders. Among various remedies, Dr. Bradstreet's wellness center reportedly carried out mercury toxicity treatments, believing that the heavy metal, mercury, was a leading factor in the development of childhood autism. And, of course, mercury was... Uh, a part of the vaccines, a big part of the vac vaccines in terms of uh, thimerosal, which was a preservative. They have removed that from some of the vaccines now, but they were they would put that in the vaccines as preservatives. I remember taking uh, thimerosal for a contact lens cleaning solution, and every time I would use that contact lens uh, cleaning solution, it would turn my eyes bright blood red immediately. And I complained to the... Uh, to the optometrist, and he said, well, um, you're probably allergic to thimerosal, so we'll have to give you something else that's, that's different. Uh, years later, when I had uh, another doctor talking to me about why I didn't use contact lenses anymore, um, he said, uh, oh, thimerosal, that's been banned. That's got mercury in it. It's like, oh, really? That's the same stuff they put as a preservative in vaccines. And I noticed an immediate reaction in my eyes. So how do you know that uh, you're not going to have a reaction to that? Uh, we don't know which people are genetically predisposed to have a reaction to it. But he found a link to mercury. He had uh, worked on that. And several people had said, he said, autism taught him more about medicine than his uh, entire 
uh, time in medical school. They say um, several people left comments on his Facebook page. Dr. Bradstreet was my son's doctor. After my son was diagnosed with autism, he worked miracles. At 16, my son is now looking at a normal life, thanks to him, and I thank him every day. Another one said, I will forever be grateful and thankful to Dr. Bradstreet for recovering my son from autism. They have set up a GoFundMe page to, they say, try to find answers to the many questions leading up to the death of Dr. Bradstreet, including an exhaustive investigation into the possibility of foul play. Now, here's what's also interesting about this. Not only is it questionable that he was trying to commit suicide with a shot in the chest instead of shooting uh, himself in the head if he was trying to commit suicide. They say that uh, the circumstances surrounding his death are made more curious by a recent multi-agency raid that was led by the FDA at his offices. They say the FDA has yet to reveal why agents searched the office of the doctor, reportedly a former pastor who has been controversial for well over a decade. So one person commented and said, uh, self-inflicted in the chest, I'm not buying it. This was a doctor who had access to pharmaceuticals of all kinds. This was a religious man with a thriving medical practice. Sorry, but this stinks of murder and a cover-up. Very interesting story. And it's also interesting how this, this turned out, as, as Adon told me. Uh, he put this story up about a week after it happened, and it only at that point been covered by the uh, local paper and uh, one other uh, publication, which was, um, uh, it was WHS, I believe, was the, uh, the, the station that it was carried at, WHNS. After we put it up, it got picked up the next day by the Daily Mail, by Forbes, Time, NBC, ABC News, everyone picking up the story, but pushing back on him and pushing back on the idea of not only his career, but the idea of foul play. Very interesting. We can have an effect. It is something that uh, we need to remember that we can push out there the information and we can get that exposed. After we reported it, it was reported on about two dozen different media outlets, many of them major media outlets. What we need to look at is the research that this uh, doctor has uh, discovered and the techniques that he used to help people. Stay with us. We're going to be right back, and we're going to talk about the flip side of taking away your informed consent. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. In the last segment, we were talking about the mysterious death of Dr. Jeff Bradstreet, who was found floating in a river in North Carolina with a single gunshot wound to the chest. They found a handgun, not a shotgun, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the river, they're blaming it on a suicide. Nevertheless, as one person pointed out, this is a guy who was very religious. He was a pastor. He also had access to all kinds of medications. And it is also not likely that someone would commit suicide by shooting themselves in the chest. Also adding to the mystery is why, after he'd been controversial for his treatment and cure of many people who had had autism, saying that he believed that it was connected to mercury, uh... After doing this for well over a decade, uh, he was raided by multiple agencies led by the FDA. We know that the FDA is moving to shut down nature paths. Uh, they've put out a comment period uh, indicating that they're going to come up with a lot of regulations to shut that down. They are concentrating this medical tyranny. And one of the key things about that is to remove our informed consent. And one of the ways that that happens is not only forcing you to take medication that they prescribe when they prescribe it in the dosages that they prescribe, removing your ability to uh, make that decision for yourself or for your family, but also to withhold other medication from you. Here's a story that uh, came out on Friday. A teen who is now breathing on his own after a controversial cannabis treatment. Let's see. It's not only autism that people have linked to vaccines, but in many, many cases, people have seen their children go into continuous and uncontrollable convulsions immediately after getting vaccinated as an adverse condition. And it appears that the only thing that really works against that is cannabis oil. We just had the Texas legislature recognize that by putting in the very first exemption for medical marijuana here in Texas for that specific condition, uncontrollable epileptic seizures. And as David Simpson, who was floating a uh, broader-based uh, legalization of marijuana, pointed out, 
many parents here in Texas, many who were constituents of his, told him about their children who had been injured after vaccines having to become essentially exiles, go live in Colorado. One of them was able to do it, to go live in Colorado, to give uh, cannabis oil to their child where it's legal. The other Texas uh, family could not afford to do that. He said it was outrageous that that would occur here in Texas. Now we have had a law passed that recognizes that that is very effective. This teen is out of New Zealand. This is out of uh, Nelson, New Zealand. They said he breathes by himself now with no help at all. Uh, his heart is strong. His lungs are strong. It's a big development, they say. He had been essentially uh, in a coma, uh, but he's now breathing on his own. He occasionally opens his eyes, and they had to send cannabis oil from the United States. They had to get special permission to do that. Why do we need to get special permission from the government for this kind of treatment? Why do we need to get special permission from the FDA if you want to try an experimental uh, treatment from Big Pharma for cancer? You have to get their permission. Why should we be limited to those types of things? If it's a life or death situation, inform people of the risks. Let them make the choice. It was interesting. I thought when they had the uh, the mandatory vaccine bill that was put up in, I think it was Oregon, it's either Oregon or Washington. There was a senator up there who was a doctor. And they pointed out in those hearings that she had done the same thing that she was trying to deny other people the right to do. In her case, she had uh, suffered from a condition and the medication that she took for her condition uh, was not supposed to be taken while she was pregnant. She did her research. She didn't feel that it was going to be a threat to her child. She did it anyway. And they said, you're denying that to people when you force them to take vaccines. But they are also denying it when they remove medication from us that we want to take because we're in a life-threatening situation or because we have seen it be effective. Stay with us. We're going to be right back and we're going to take your calls. Now, I'm going to take your calls in just a few minutes. If you want to call in on the Sunday line, it's a different number. It is 877-789-2539. That's 877-789-ALEX. If you want to uh, call in and weigh in on the topics we've been talking about today, the massive sea changes that we've seen in just the last week with the passing of Fast Track and the trade agreements that may be coming through with that, the global governance that that will usher in if those trade agreements are passed the Pope speaking out for world government in the name of climate change, and then, of course, the two Supreme Court decisions that we had this last week that will have a massive effect in terms of, one, the same-sex marriage issue, as well as the one on Obamacare. Yet another uh, just flat-out ignoring what the law says, as uh, uh, Scalita says, uh, we're just making this up, we ought to call it SCOTUS care. But yet again, we see Justice Roberts coming in to the rescue of Obamacare, first pronouncing that it wasn't an unconstitutional mandate to buy somebody's products, then saying um, uh, that it was a tax instead and they could do it, and then coming in this last week and uh, rewriting uh, the bill for Congress because they were going to have uh, it dependent on state exchanges subsidizing it. Many of the states had not put those exchanges in, so to make it work, Justice Roberts and the majority said, we'll just ignore what the law says because we know what they intended. It doesn't matter what they wrote. It doesn't matter what the words say. We'll just go with what they intended. Uh, before we get to your calls, before we get to some more news, I want to let you know that this segment of the Alex Jones Show is made possible by the products that we sell at InfoWarsLife.com. Products like Super Male Vitality. You know, summer's here. Now is the time to transform your body to get healthier. Super Male Vitality combines the best organic herbs and extracts to make that possible. Thousands have already used Super Male Vitality with lots of great feedback. We have over 500 inspirational reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Here's just a couple I wanted to read you. Here's one from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They say, uh, I'm a 60-year-old grandfather. This is... Uh, the person's name is Keep On Pedaling is the way they put it there. I find the Super Male Vitality to be indispensable. I have improved my strength and endurance with regular use of the product. I take three droppers three times a day. I find my muscle tone has improved. I have better definition, muscle size with irregular workouts. It also appears to help in maintaining my weight. I bike about 100 miles per week. And my average mile per hour and top speed have improved by about three to five miles per hour. 
that's one active grandpa, but uh, he's taking care of himself and he's taking uh, supplements that are going to help him do that. He says it's also helpful in raising sex drive and performance. The only thing not so great about it is the price. I learned a long time ago, though, you get less when you pay less. We've got another one here, too, from Mike C. in uh, San Rafael, California. He says, are you looking for more energy? How about more passion? Maybe you'd like a little more focus. Well, you've come to the right place. Super Male Vitality packs all that into a simple sublingual application. That's what I like, too, the fact that it's that it's uh, liquid, that you can easily absorb it, very quickly absorb it. Uh, and his, uh, talking about sublingual, you put it under your tongue, uh, very quickly assimilate into the system. He says, I've been taking it. Since it came out, I've loved it from the get-go. I now have my son on it who takes it every day, and my wife takes the super female vitality. I don't think you'll be dissatisfied with your purchase. Again, we have a lot of reviews that you can see there, and um, over 500 uh, on that product at InfoWarsLife.com. Check out the reviews. Get your bottle of super male vitality and while supplies last at InfoWarsLife.com. Well, getting back to uh, the news, I'm going to go to your calls in just one moment. I want to cover one more story here because I, I thought this was really interesting, especially because of Jurassic uh, uh, Park, the uh, the fourth in the series uh, coming out this week. What was it? Jurassic World, I think, uh, came out about a week and a half ago. We enjoyed it. I mean, it's just an escapist uh, summer entertainment. My family and I started listening to... Uh, the original Jurassic Park book on audio tape. And uh, it's interesting because it's got a lot more detail behind it. One of the things that he does is to go into the whole uh, idea of GMOs and the potential for abuse. Because you remember in the movie, the very first one, the Jeff Goldblum character says, well, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So he talks a lot about the potential science of, of that and how they put it together. But he also talks about some of the issues. And I thought about that again when I saw this story a couple of days ago on Infowars.com about this lamb that was genetically modified with jellyfish DNA and sold as meat in France. They made this lamb, they, they added jellyfish DNA so that the lamb would glow in the dark. <laughs> they called it... Uh, they call them green sheep, okay? So they add uh, jellyfish fluorescent genes to the sheep so they will glow in the dark. And that was one of the things that Michael Crichton addressed in Jurassic Park. He said, you know, the biotechnology revolution differs in multiple aspects from past scientific transformations. He says it's broad-based. And of course, we're going to see broad-based changes from AI, from uh, biotech, you know, genetic modification. We're also going to see it from nanotechnology. We have got several different technologies that are so broad-based and so deep that it's going to fundamentally transform this world. And many people are concerned that it's not going to be for the better. People like Michael Crichton, for example. And when I say broad-based, I mean that they're going to affect every industry. It's not just going to be that you're going to have automation within the agricultural industry where uh, you don't need as many farm workers, but they're going to move on to other types of industries. No, it's going to affect every industry at the same time. And it's going to affect it from top to bottom. It's not going to just replace people who are doing manual, uh, menial, repetitive tasks. It's going to replace people who are managers, people who are decision makers, people who are uh, in service industries. It's going to affect every strata, and it's going to affect every industry. AI, GMO, nanotech, all these different things. But one of the things that he points out, and this ties into this story about this lamb that was made to glow in the dark with jellyfish DNA. He says, much of the research is thoughtless or frivolous. This is Michael Crichton writing back decades ago uh, in the original Jurassic Park novel. He says, efforts to engineer paler trout for better visibility in the stream or square trees for easier lumbering and injectable scent cells so that you'll always smell of your favorite perfume may seem like a joke, but they're not. Indeed, the fact that biotechnology can be applied to the industries traditionally subject to the vagaries of fashion, such as cosmetics and leisure activities, heightens concern about the whimsical use of this powerful new technology. The most disturbing is the fact that no watchdogs are found among scientists themselves. It's remarkable that nearly every scientist in genetics research is also engaged in the commerce of biotechnology, in the commerce of it, you see. There are no detached observers 
everyone has a stake. And he says the commercialization of molecular biology is the most stunning ethical event in the history of science. Now, keep that in mind and add to that the idea that virtually every new treatment for every disease is becoming a vaccine. Why? Because they have legal immunity. If they give you something as a vaccine and it causes a problem, they're covered by a special category. They create the vaccine court to give them protection. So if they call it a vaccine, they don't have the legal exposure that they do if they give you an antibiotic that fails or if they give you a different type of drug that has a negative side effect. If they call it a vaccine, they're covered. They're given special immunity in the United States. And a large part of these new vaccines are genetically modified aspects. And so when we look at this and we think about how we have given and are giving through these mandatory vaccine bills, we are given giving the power to big pharma and to the AMA to set how many of these we're going to take, the frequency at which we're going to take them, the timing at which we're going to take them. We've already talked to uh, multiple times to Michelle Roden with Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines telling us that they know that they're going to harm premature, low birth weight infants, but they do it anyway. They inject them anyway. They say, get ready. We're going to have to have intubation because we're going to give these uh, babies the injection because they're two months old, even though they're not really two months old. They're preemies. That's what we have to be concerned about. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with your call. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. On this Sunday, we're going to go to callers in just one moment. I'm David Knight, your host today. We're going to go to Vincent in North Carolina in just a moment. Uh, before we do, I want to let you know this segment of the Alex Jones Show is made possible by our Made in 1776 clothing line. Now, the clothes that we have there are all made in America. I think that's something that's very important. We look at the exportation of jobs, uh, the globalists moving everything out of our country one way that you can fight that is to support people who are still making stuff in this country. And everything that we sell there in our Made in 1776 line is made right here in the United States. We have, for right now, limited time, 25% off of our best-selling Molon Lave belt buckles. Again, you can find that at InfoWarsStore.com, our Made in 1776 line. Go to the... Uh, Click on the Made in 1776 right up there on the left-hand side. You'll see it there showing that right there if you're watching uh, on, a, on a monitor right now. Let's go to Vincent in North Carolina. Vincent, you want to talk about uh, global warming and what the Pope said about it this last week? Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I had uh, recently been in contact with uh, one of the people at the LaRouche Pack. Um, Alex has had Lyndon LaRouche on several times. And uh, they were just explaining that this is basically the you know the Vatican is advocating the uh, the fraud that we all have to be afraid of global warming, but it really promotes the excuse to put in these controls yes. uh, across the board where you know people will be forced to uh, cut back on on a lot of things they enjoy, namely jobs as well. Yes. Just like we've seen with this TPP bill. And oh, yeah. uh, that, in my opinion, would be a great way to start with the population reduction. Is you, if you don't have, a, have uh, an industrial base, you can't support a population. So, Well, and, and uh, that's, not, uh, that's not just a wild extrapolation that you're making there either, because the guy who's his chief science advisor, one of his three spokesmen when he uh, released the encyclical, is a guy named John Schellenhuber. He's a German scientist with a, a German organization that works on climate change. And he has said that we need to get rid of 6 billion people. That's what the Pope's new appointment to the Pontifical Science Advisory Council uh, has said. He's for population control. He's also for world government. He's proposed that we have an Earth Constitution, that we have a global uh, council, that we have a planetary court that is going to enforce all this. Everything is at the global level. Now, the Pope didn't talk about those three aspects, but he says that we need to have some kind, he's very vague about it, uh, some kind of global control of the uh, economy of uh, climate. And of course, it's not just about CO2. The Pope is not happy with a free market either. 
And what we're seeing is not a free market. We all know that. We know that that is it's the multinational corporations that are driving this. It's crony capitalism writ large. They're the ones who are writing uh, the uh, trade uh, agreements that are coming down the line that are really trade treaties. It's not free trade. It's not free market. These few corporations are writing these laws in order to consolidate power, to consolidate ownership of everything. They're extending uh, just in looking at copyrights, they're extending their power to maintain copyrights indefinitely so that they can continue to own everything. We see it in the kind of attitudes that we see from uh, the director of Uber, who says that once we get self-driving cars, they're going to become very cheap. Then private ownership goes away for everybody, of course, except for him. He will have ownership of all of the cars. And that's the mindset of all these global capitalists who are working the small click of people. It's not mom and pop businesses and the free market that are the problem. It's not even good sized corporations that are the problem. It's the multinational corporations that band together in these cartels and get control of governments and pass these uh, treaties that we're about to see coming through. Thank you so much, Vincent. Let's go to uh, JT in Colorado. JT. Hey, David. Hey. Yeah, you know. It, it, to um, to follow up on 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 what the fellow from North Carolina just said, um, they what we have is a coalition between government and and corporate uh, corporations worldwide that are really just sucking the uh, uh, power and energy and money and everything out of the people. It's a giant vampiric system. Yes. And, you know, and they have control of the media, so they can provocateur creating a problem which will bring a natural human reaction, at least most people that aren't completely fluoride addled. Mm -hmm. And because they do control the media, and they're masters of psychology, they can uh, set the solution, uh, a dipole solution, like it'll be, well, you, we've got these people that are that are for us here, and then we've got deniers over here, and thereby maintain uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the divide and conquer, the division of the masses. And, well, what they're creating, essentially, is the same thing that was on the Cyclops Island, if, you, if you're into allegory at all, and you want to read some Homer. Uh, Homer's Odyssey, the the section on on uh, uh, Polyphemus, and they are the monster. They are the monolithic, systematic socialist system yeah. that will destroy all of us. Oh, absolutely! It's just amazing to me to see how they're trying to justify this, even though their models have failed, even though we haven't seen uh, warming along the lines that they have predicted, even though we haven't seen an increase in humidity. Even though they are keeping their data that they use to feed into their failed models, even though they won't release that data. That's why we had Climate Gate 1. We had Climate Gate 2. I was part of an organization that tried to get information out of the University of Virginia regarding Michael Mann's correspondence. Uh, this is all stuff that was paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, he said it was private, even though he was doing it on the university's time uh, while he was at work. And they were using the conclusions of their research to affect policy. And so the public has a right to know that. But we saw the same kind of treatment there that we saw with Lois Lerner's emails. Uh, first, they said, uh, well, we don't have them anymore. Then the um, uh, Sierra Club came in and asked for some of their information, and they gave it to them. At that point, the attorney general said, wait a minute, you just lied to us. You had told us uh, that you didn't have that information anymore. Oh, well, we just happened to find it. You know, that same type of thing that we saw with the IRS. So it's, it's a, a technique that they're using to try to establish control over everyone and over everything. And they can establish that control much more effectively if they come after our energy usage than they can if they control our money. But there's, of course, a financial dimension to that as well. Thank you so much, uh, JT in Colorado. Let's go to Ronnie in Austin. Go ahead, Ronnie. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to agree with you wholeheartedly on the overwhelming nature of the problems that we have right now. And as a lifelong politically active person, 
I really feel overwhelmed at this point. And I think that's their strategy, and that's, in my mind, our key to our recovery. And that one thing we can all agree on, uh, no matter what your main issue is, is that it's our Constitution that's under full-fledged attack. Yes, absolutely. So, Hang on. We're going we're uh, to come right back. I'll give you some more chance to talk right after the break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to go back to our callers. Uh, we're going to go to finish up with uh, Ronnie and Austin. We're also going to talk to uh, Chris, Gary, Wallace, Zach. So hang on. We're going to get right to you. Before we do, I want to let you know that this hour of the Alex Jones Show is brought to you by the high-quality products we sell at InfoWarsLife.com. Products like Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. X2 has over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Over 99% of the respondents would recommend it to a friend or family. Remember, we have absolutely been blown away by this response. And let me just read you a couple of these, uh, a couple of these reviews here. Because like I said, we've got over 400 of them there that are uh, positive. One of them, uh, this is from uh, PS90 Girl, Wabash, Indiana. I love this product. It's great for my body. Contributed to weight loss. I don't go a day without taking it. Another one from Big Coop in Hennessy, Oklahoma. Excellent energy uh, boost of, uh, as well as a mental boost. I like the taste, and I al and also would rather take liquid supplements any day, and so would I, because I can take all these supplements. Uh, I don't have to swallow a ton of pills. I can put them all in one drink and kick them back, and I know that they get absorbed very readily into the body in liquid form. Again, get your bottle of X2. You can read about those uh, reviews. As, as I point out, there's more than 400 of them there at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Now, I want to go back to... Uh, Ronnie in Austin, he was talking about attacks on the Constitution. We had to go to a commercial break. Uh, Ronnie, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, it, it, the thing that the, the strategy in my mind is that all like minded constitutional enthusiasts, libertarian leaning, maybe uh, open minded Republicans and Democrats and independents and others, uh, it, the time is now. The assault is so immense and overwhelming that everybody can unite. We can all come to our senses on this, and so I'm thinking we should just take over the Constitution Party, which exists, at least here in Texas, or it has here in Austin, and uh, that would be our, I'm considering political vehicle to, uh, you know, instead of trying to take over uh, the Republicans or the Democrats or even the Libertarian Party is pretty controlled from my viewpoint, but if we could get on the Constitution Party, mm -hmm. because that's what we're talking about, I think that's what we can all agree in and uh, agree on, it's under full-fledged assault right now, and that maybe that'll inspire more people than usual. That's what I'm hoping and praying. I agree. So, I mean, I, I've been involved, uh, years ago I was involved in the Libertarian Party. I, I just know how they control the ballot. I mean, it's, it's one of the many corrupt aspects of our system they do not want to have, and they've got plenty of mechanisms to make sure that they don't uh, allow third parties to participate, or independents for that matter. So there's a lot of ballot access laws. Uh, with a third party, you wind up spending almost all of your time and money uh, just trying to get on the ballot, and then once you do, they keep you out of the debates. It's a very uh, corrupt system. I agree, and I'm not really quite sure what to do about it. I think we can start making some of those changes that badly need to be made if we don't focus too much on the big uh, ticket races, okay? Don't focus all your efforts on president. Uh, president really isn't going to have much of an issue, uh, much of a change uh, that they're going to be able to make because we have such an uh, entrenched bureaucracy. What we need to do is we need to focus, I think, at the local level. If we got some honest people in at the local level, they'd be able to do some things like change ballot access. They'd be able to do things like block overreach from the federal government. They would be able to do things like uh, get people to understand and, and, and make it easier to use jury nullification. We need to start thinking locally. We need to start thinking how we as individuals can make a difference instead of thinking about how we're going to get someone who is going to be our champion to go up to Washington, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and single-handedly stop this massive cancer that we have up there. We need to find a way to uh, to block that cancer and then cut it out of our lives, and that has to be done at the local level. I think that's where we're really going to see change happen. So, yeah, I agree with you. We need to all get involved. I think people left and right need to really understand what's going on with these trade agreements, what a total screw job they are how they are going to be coming out. As many people on the left, I think, understand it because they see the impact on health, on medicine, on jobs. But people on the conservative side, people who typically work with the Republicans, 
look at this and they just see free trade. That's what they're being told. And they don't see those issues. They don't understand this is also going to be used for gun control. It'll be used for immigration. It'll be used for a variety of things. But we're, no matter where you are on these issues, you should be appalled at the fact that this is a treaty that's being has been written over years by corporate lobbyists that the public is not allowed to see and putting a gag order on the congressman. And most of them could care less to even go look at it because they've been told how to vote. They don't need to know what's in it. They're going to do what their corporate masters tell them to do. Any other comments, Ronnie, before we move on? Yeah, I think we just need to legalize freedom and <laughs> concentrate on that. And, and uh, like you said, uh, uh, just facing reality and, and going forward, just don't let, don't be discouraged by the overwhelming nature. I think that's part of their strategy to overwhelm exactly. us. Exactly. And, and I think, uh, thank you so much, Ronnie. Yeah, and I think one of the things that they do, one of the things that makes me think that our success is going to be at the local level is because whenever we would get ballot access as a third party, they would always make retention uh, dependent upon getting a large percentage of the vote either for governor or president. And that would cause us to do two things. It would cause us to focus all of our money and all of our effort to getting on the ballot. And then it would cause us to focus on the most unwinnable races. But we also need to understand that once we get somebody elected president, even if it is somebody who's good, they're not going to be able to do nearly as much to stop the out-of-control bureaucracies that basically are their own little petty kingdoms out there with their own legislation that they write, their own police force, their own courts. They're their own little governments coming at us individually, all at once. Okay, They have, they have uh, created swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. And the way we need to stop that is with nullification at the state level, standing on due process and other things. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Gary in Pennsylvania. Gary, go ahead. Hi, thank, thank you, Mr. Knight. Um, so thinking about like the collapse in Greece, and well, it's not really collapsed yet, but in the euro and everything, for those of you, I'm sure David knows, but for those of you who don't know, the Greek council is recommending that starting Tuesday there's going to be a 60 euro limit on ATM withdrawals from the bank. Um, so, I mean, like, like Alex and many of us have been feeling, I think that, you know, something is definitely going on, something that's unprecedented. We all feel that something's just wrong. Yes. Um, so my question to David is, is, is this going to cause in this Greece thing? Is this going to cause some fast domino or ripple effect uh, to the rest of the world, including like the U.S., China, Russia? Uh, is this possibly part of the reason for Jade Helm? I'm, is this like all tied in together or, or what do you think? Well, we do know that our government has been looking at ways to do currency control. I mean, we've had... Uh, uh, we've had a lot of economists here that are very highly placed with the largest banks as well as with the government talking about the need for eliminating cash, the need for having currency control. So they're concerned about the very same thing happening here, uh, just not necessarily at this time. But I think it's, it's something that we all need to look at. I think that, that when you see the preparations that are being made by the banks, the preparations that are being made by the governments, when you see all of this, you understand as well as when we talked to Michael Snyder, if you remember, it was uh, last, I think it was last Thursday, uh, I interviewed him and he said he's never seen so many different people predicting an economic collapse and so from so many different perspectives, different models that they had, people from uh, all different types of uh, disciplines looking at all of this, concerned that there's going to be some kind of economic collapse. I know that our government is, I think that's what has been behind this uh, buildup of military equipment with the police forces. I think that's what's behind Jade Helm. Jade Helm is tied in very closely what the special forces are doing to geospatial intelligence. When we look at what's happening with the massive surveillance from the government, that is all tied together with special forces. It's military, it's surveillance, the uh, NSA, the CIA, as well as law enforcement. They are all working together to put this a uh, massive surveillance grid in place and of course mapping it on uh, mapping what they know about you onto a map is a big part of it and as one of the uh, people selling this for IBM said the ultimate biometric is your space time and travel data that's your meta tags of course we were told that didn't matter stay with us we're going to be right back we're going to talk to Chris in South Bend next then Wallace and the Ozarks and Zach in Wisconsin stay with us in this final segment, we're trying to get through as many calls as we can. We're going to go to Chris, Wallace, Zach, Francis, uh, Mad Wilt, I think, uh, is coming on there as well. Let's go to uh, Chris in South Bend. Chris. Greetings, Mr. Knight. Hey, how you doing? What's up? What do you want to talk about? Um, first, 
I just did a liver cleanse, just got done yesterday. First, two quick lightning points I wanted to get your take on about the gay marriage Supreme Court decision. I mean, that's fine. And now can we legalize guns in all states? And B, <laughs> if, uh, if someone wants, you were talking about Big Pharma earlier. There's a movie out there, back that was made in 2006 that shows the corruption of Big Pharma it's using Africa as a big, giant guinea pig. It's called oh, yeah. The Constant Gardener, and it, and it stars Ralph Fiennes. That's a great movie this audience would absolutely love. It's called The Constant but, Gardener? Const, yeah. con, Constant Gardener. Okay, I haven't seen that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down because I want to see that. Yeah, good. I just watched it a couple nights ago because I'm on this liver cleanse, so it's like when I get back home, it's like you know, you got to eat a really good dinner and all this, and it's just something. It's, it's like two hours and... 10 minutes or something. So it's a really good. This audience would absolutely love that movie. It's just well, it's good. And, and yeah, yeah. So I, it's, it's something you can watch while you do the liver cleanse. There you go. I, I was going to do that myself, but they, they sold out of it. If, if people want to get on the waiting list, uh, they can still sign up for that, and we'll give them an email when uh, when liver cleanse comes back in. But it is sold out at the moment. But is, is that working out good for you? <laughs> sure. I mean, okay. I started on Tuesday, and I'll tell you, I lost about five pounds in five days, and wow. uh, I, I was able to work out while I was doing it pretty good. I mean, I wasn't a, I wasn't limited to what I was able to do working out. I was able to do my routine just fine. I highly recommend it. It's a lot easier to do this if you do this along with a friend or a family member mm -hmm. because you can kind of text, communicate back and forth. Hey, how are you feeling right now? What did you have for lunch? What did you have for breakfast? What do you have for lunch tomorrow? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. It's always hard to do that on your own. I always prefer if I'm going to do something in terms of a change of diet or change of exercise regime, it's always much easier if I do it with my wife or with the family, something like that. that that's that's a good good point. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And that's a good tip on a movie. And certainly we have seen uh, not only Africa, but Africans in America. Look at the Tuskegee Institute. That's one of the reasons that we push so hard and say we cannot give up informed consent because we don't want to see people experimented on for the quote-unquote greater good. That's what happened in the Nazi war criminal camps, right? But, of course, we brought those guys over to the United States after the war. As part of Operation Paperclip, we put them in charge of our biochemical uh, and bioweapons labs, okay? And now we've got labs that are working on gain of function. I mean, you talk about Jurassic Park and uh, biotechnology that's out of control. I mean, these people are bringing in dangerous uh, diseases that are not uh, native to the U.S. They are intensifying them in the sense that they are what they call gain of function is making them easier to catch and harder to kill. What a great idea. But of course, that's bioweapons uh, technology, and that's a big part of the experimentation that's going on in Africa. It's uh, bioweapons. Uh, John Rappaport has pointed that out, how the um, same group that was involved with the Tuskegee uh, in Institute uh, experiments was over there uh, in Africa when Ebola broke out. And the government there was very suspicious in Sierra Leone and told them, get out of here. They were concerned that they were the uh, source of it, whether they, it leaked out uh, unintentionally or whether it was put out intentionally. Uh, let's go to Wallace in the Ozarks. Go ahead, Wallace. Okay, I think Wallace is gone. Let's go to Zach in Wisconsin. Hey, David. Hey. Um, I just graduated from college recently with a degree in environmental engineering, and the stuff I was being taught about Agenda 21 and climate change was just garbage. I mean, they're trying to shut down all these coal power plants, but people don't realize that the technology we have on them today with these electrostatic precipitators and these wet scrubbers, they do a really good job about filtering all this uh, VOCs and all this um, other garbage out of them. Oh, yeah. And then they're being opened right on the Mexico border, right on in China, and that pollution will come to the United States. It doesn't just stay in that country. The winds will pick it up and bring it here, and people don't realize that this is a global thing. And I don't know, we have coal to last us a couple hundred years at least at the rate we're using it, but it's just being shut down or moving towards more ridiculous forms of energy. And I don't know, I, I just think this needs to stop and we need to get back to uh, an industrial powerhouse that the United States was known for in the early 20th century. Absolutely. You know, I, I don't know if you heard when I was talking about this magazine I have from 1979, it was, uh, let's see, it's Newsweek, their special report on energy. And they had a chart there and they were telling us that we had 8.7 years left of oil. We had 10.7 years left of gas, natural gas, and we had 665 
uh, 666.5 years left of coal. <laughs> I mean, when I saw that 36 years ago, I went hysterical laughing, and I've saved this magazine. You can see it. It's yellowed right now. But it's exactly that same kind of absurdity, absurdity you're talking about, Zach. Uh, when they tell us that global warming is a problem, but they give carte blanche to uh, China, to other, to, to India or to Mexico to build uh, power plants that don't have the same kind of controls that they have here. Just as you pointed out, they have uh, scrubbers and other things that can burn this very cleanly. But they stop that in the United States, and then they allow other countries to build older style, uh, not reactors, but uh, generators that are going to have that pollution. It's absolutely amazing to me, the hypocrisy. But, of course, it's simply about control. Zach, I, when I was talking about this, I, I pointed out that their solution was the same thing that we're seeing right now, and that is more tax, more rationing, more federal control. Do you recall the, uh, the reports that we did about the EPA, Zach, when they were pushing this fine particulate matter and they were doing human testing on people in North Carolina, later did it, in California, do you remember that, where they're hooking them up directly to diesel exhaust and seeing if they could get a reaction from them? Do you remember that? Oh, that was just ridiculous. I mean, um, I tried to tell my sister, who's a doctor, about that. She's like, oh, no, they can't do human testing on that kind of stuff. They're like, no, this is the report right here. They're yes. doing this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They're manipulating the um, the tests and everything to get the the process and control that they want to happen. And it, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, they were exposing people to up uh, 70 times... I think it was 72 times what they said was uh, the upper limit that would cause death. That's what Lisa Jackson, the EPA director, was telling Congress at the time. She said, more people are dying from fine particulate matter than are dying from cancer. So we need to shut down all power generation. And in order to push that policy through, they were hooking people up to diesel exhaust. They were running ads looking for people who had respiratory issues, who had heart issues, and they were deliberately trying to give these people health issues so they could justify upping the ante. Absolute insanity. Thank you so much, uh, Zach. Let's go to Francis in New York. Francis, go ahead. Hey, Mr. Knight. How are you? Pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to you. I have a question to ask you. Um, did you ever hear of a document that was published in, um, on September 17, 1973? It, it's called the uh, Regionalized and Adaptive Model of Global World System. And that document states that they have to create 10 kingdoms around the world. And I believe that the, um, the, um, the trans, you know, that thing that they passed this past week mm -hmm. um, and with the TPP, you think that they can actually go get that through with the TPP on the North American Union? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, when I look at these, uh, the TPP and the uh, TTIP, that's the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnerships, and we look at what happened with the North American Free Trade Agreement that we all said at the time was North American Union, but everybody poo-pooed that idea. We had David Petraeus saying last year, look, we, we're past America. We now have North America, meaning North American Union. He said we're 20 years in Africa. We've got the three countries together. When I look at it, I see the blueprint of Brzezinski, who set up the Trilateral Commission. You remember he had the, the book Between Two Ages that he wrote in 1970, and then they created the Trilateral Commission in 1973. David Rockefeller paid for it. Brzezinski was the first president of it. He essentially saw three regional uh, consolidations economically and then eventually politically, and then joining those together into a world government. We are essentially the spine. America is the spine of this. They're adding uh, the, the Asian wing as well as the European wing to it at the same time. So it looks to me like that is their the way that they're consolidating all this, the steps that they're taking. And, of course, it begins with a trade union. It begins with an economic union. And then as we're seeing now with this situation in Greece, they create economic uh, crises and then use that to take political sovereignty. They've made it clear that that was their their program all along. And, of course, we see that with the Bilderberg Group. We see that with the Trilateral Commission. We see it with the Club of Rome, as you're pointing out, with the Council on Foreign Relations. These are all different groups. Uh, there's others as well where they get together, they put these plans together. And this is something that has been out there for a very long time. It's not any secret. But now it's coming to pass. And that's the thing that concerns all of us. Well, that's it for our program today. Thank you so much, uh, Francis. Uh, sorry I couldn't get to you, uh, Mad Wit and Detroit. Um, join us tomorrow at 11 Central for the Alex Jones Radio.